Is administering a test to your class best used to assess how much learning your students have done? Or is administering a test in your class best used as a strategy for learning in the first place? Well, in my opinion, the answer is a definite yes. Welcome to the A&P Professor, a few minutes to focus on teaching human anatomy and physiology with host Kevin Patton. I'm making plans for um, this summer going to the big HAPS conference. Human Anatomy and Physiology Society has their big annual conference coming up in Columbus, Ohio before too long. And I was just (laughs) looking at my files and I realized that the first HAPS conference I went to was in 1990 in Madison, Wisconsin. Gary Johnson, my old friend, um, was the... uh, conference host and organizer that year. And it was uh, at that meeting that uh, I remember we voted to actually create the Human Anatomy and Physiology Society. And I haven't missed one annual conference since. I learned so much at those conferences. And I tell you, half of what I learned isn't in the sessions. I, I learned a lot in the sessions. There are update sessions where we have uh, uh, various uh, experts and very focused fields come and update us on what some of the latest things are that help inform our teaching of human anatomy and physiology. We'll do that for a couple of days. At the same time, we're visiting with various vendors, including publishers and uh, suppliers of equipment and other kinds of resources. And uh, and then uh, usually the next two days, we spend out at the host campus we're doing workshops and uh, taking mini field trips and things like that and uh, learning from each other. And the whole time, uh, there's all kinds of uh, opportunities for um, uh, interacting with one another, whether it's a, a two or three minute uh, hello, uh, I'm Kevin, uh, I'm from Missouri, where are you from and what do you do? And we start to chat or it could be end up in a whole half hour or hour long conversation. If any of you have gotten uh, trapped into a conversation with me, you t- you know that I can just keep talking on and on and on. Um, so um, sign up. If you've never been to one, you, you, you have to try it. And I, I know it's a big sacrifice in terms of time and money to get there and do that. But uh, it's well worth it, and it can really re-energize you. And I swear, I know people who were burned out on teaching or burned out on teaching A&P, and this revitalized them, and they went on to do super wonderful things for decades after that. And I am not making that up. This happens all the time. It's something you got to go to. I strongly encourage you. And um, my plan is to be there. So when you see me around, uh, grab me and um, say hello, and uh, we'll chat a little bit. So do that. Go to um, the website, which you can find in the show notes, and it'll take you right to the conference page uh, so you don't have to hunt around. And uh, go ahead and sign up. Do it quick before it, uh, the, the hotel fills up. Hypertension. You probably uh, heard the uh, big news at the end of 2017 about the new guidelines. Uh, Technically, they're called the 2017 Guideline for the Prevention, Detection, Evaluation, and Management of High Blood Pressure in Adults, and uh, really kind of made a big splash in the news because uh, now all of a sudden, a lot more people under the new guidelines uh, can be labeled as having elevated... uh, blood pressure, uh, or hypertension, because the numbers have shifted a little bit. And, um, you know, when you, you, you sort of delve into it past the headline, you find out that, uh, well, you know, not as much has changed as we think in terms of these recommendations. Um, one of the main authors uh, stated that, you know, we're still going to talk about 120 over 80 as normal, Um, even though technically it's like right across the border into elevated area. But um, we can still kind of talk about that as a normal starting point of a discussion. And anything above that, uh, we're going to say, look, this might be a cause for concern. We're going to look at you 
as an individual, which is, of course, the um, the the trend we've seen for quite a while in uh, clinical medicine, right, is that, um, you know, doing more and more of evaluation of the the whole story behind a patient, not just this number alone and that number alone. And so these new guidelines are really emphasizing that approach. And uh, another thing that really, really uh, uh, makes me happy is that they they really point out that if you're going to manage uh, blood pressure, uh, even assess it correctly, uh, you need to teach the patient how to do that and do it in their own environment and take a number of readings that that one reading that you get, or maybe two readings that you get in the doctor's office during your checkup, uh, is not necessarily going to be indicative of much of anything. I know that's true for me. My blood pressure, even though I love my physician, I love his staff, I always have a a good experience, other than occasionally being sick when I go into their office. I have a higher blood pressure, significantly higher blood pressure, when they're taking my blood pressure than when I'm at home. And so I brought in my own blood pressure apparatus, uh, had it calibrated to uh, that in the office. And so I know that they're reading the same numbers. And then when I do it at home, it's much better. There are much lower numbers. And uh, apparently, I'm not the exception to the rule. But apparently, most people get what they sometimes call white coat syndrome and get a higher blood pressure when somebody else is taking it, especially if they're a clinical person. So these guidelines kind of, you know, fit into that and say, make sure it's taken correctly and make sure you're not looking at just one number and take into the into account the fact that a number taken clinically is not necessarily the true baseline resting um, blood pressure. Now, um, another thing that has happened here, you may remember under the old guidelines that uh, prehypertension was a category that you might be in before uh, you were actually classified as having hypertension. So now the categories go this way. There's normal blood pressure, so that goes up to uh, 120 over 80. Uh, and then once you cross that line, you're now in the area of elevated blood pressure, which used to be called prehypertension, but now we're calling it elevated blood pressure. And um, and then uh, once we get to uh, 130 to 139 over 80 to 89, now we're in hypertension. And that's divided up into stage one and stage two. And once we hit 140 over 90, then we're in stage two hypertension. And uh, once we get to uh, 180 over 120, or either of those numbers get hit in 180 or the 120, then we're in what's called a hypertensive crisis. So that's kind of a new designation as well. So I don't know about you, but in my a and courses, I don't necessarily get into a whole lot of the diagnostics and so on of blood pressure, although we do go through these categories and kind of point out that, you know, this is a, a big health issue and, and so on. Um, so, you know, to boil it down, what do we need to know for those of us who aren't really going into the clinical end of things? at least not too much. Um, one is you probably need to update whatever chart you're using to cut off the blood pressures. And most of the textbooks don't have that in them yet because it's too new. And well, you know, production of a textbook takes a long time. So, um, you know, they're not uh, going to necessarily get in there right away. Uh, it's also good to remember that a blood pressure of 120 over 80 is still considered a starting point for discussing blood pressure. And um, so that's you don't have to change out all your diagrams that show that as, you know, the uh, sort of starting point or, or even just as an example of, uh, I, or of blood pressure, period. Also, uh, you know, uh, consider uh, bringing this up in your class and talk about the fact that this was recently changed and that, uh, you know, guidelines for diagnosis, prevention, treatment, uh, various other clinical recommendations, they often change over time. And so you can discuss, well, why is that? Why do they change? Is it the human uh, physiology that's changing? Or, well, no, that's not right. Of course, it's how much we know and what experience we've had um, in terms of treating people and the, the best way to treat people, especially when you're looking at the big picture of um, you know, uh, public health. Um, so 
anyway, just want to bring you up to date in the show notes and uh, also in the episode webpage at theapprofessor.org. I have uh, actually a free slide you can use that has the new charts and um, a bunch of links to various articles and even the, uh, the official publication of the new guidelines if you want to dive into those. In a previous podcast, I talked about uh, spaced retrieval practice. That is the idea of using tests and quizzes in a formative way that is as a teaching and learning tool rather than in a summative or evaluative way and it being an assessment of their final learning. And when you use uh, testing as a teaching and learning tool, um, there are a variety of ways to do that. In a previous episode, I talked about how uh, I've created my own test bank of uh, of uh, test items and give the students many more tests than I uh, did in the olden days. And they're all online tests and uh, they're randomized and uh, so they don't always get the same version of a test. And uh, they can take more than one attempt. They can take uh, up to three attempts and what will be recorded in their course grade is uh, just the highest score they get of all three. So they're not afraid if they get a good score in the first one, they're not afraid to take the second and third. Because the idea is I want them to do the spaced retrieval practice. That is, I want them to take many tests over a period of time, giving a little bit of time in between and uh, let them in the, letting them forget a little bit. Do a test again, let them forget a little bit. By the time they get to the third test, they're finding they, they're really being able to pull that out of their um, uh, memories very easily. That's the retrieval part of spaced retrieval practice. And so in that uh, previous podcast, I mentioned I talk a little bit more about how I do these online tests that I make myself. Uh, before I really get into that, though, I just want to mention that this is just one option, and it's an option that I took because at the time I started this, this was before there was wide availability of all of these wonderful tools that we have now, many of which are available from our textbook publishers. Uh, all the major textbook publishers have some type of online online testing, adaptive learning tool, whatever they call it, where they're going to be continually doing this spaced retrieval practice with the students. So that those test items that are in there that are built into that, they've already been built. And I would recommend that if you're going to use those, that, that you go in and um, as much as you're able to, depending on the platform, go in and make sure that it's tailored to your particular course and your particular objectives and what you're focusing on for your students and your class in that semester. Uh, but back in the olden days, we didn't have that available. And so it was up to me. I knew that this would be a powerful tool. And as it turns out, it, man, <laughs> it really had a huge impact on my students' uh, final exam scores. They were learning things much better and for a longer term than they ever were before. I am so glad. And they felt uh, less pressure because it was totally up to them in the olden days, to learn this stuff. And then I'd come in and test them using that summative, evaluative kind of test and say, okay, you should have you should already know all this stuff in here. I'm going to test and see whether you do. I never really um, assigned them too many things that allowed them to do the practice uh, without there being huge consequences for messing around. So if they messed around, which is kind of our natural human tendency sometimes, they didn't do so well on the tests all the time. But now they were starting to do it, even those students who really weren't good at studying because, well, they were studying by doing these online tests and they didn't realize that that's what they were doing. They were doing studying or what we called in the old days homework when <laughs> I mentioned last time. Oh my gosh, that's there's a lot of emotional baggage with that word, isn't there? But when I tell them they have online tests and they're open book, and they can even uh, consult with other students. They can consult with me. They can consult with tutors in the learning center as long as they're not getting the actual answers from them. That is, you know, number one is A, number two is B, number three is carbamino hemoglobin. Uh, as long as they're not doing that, but just kind of bouncing ideas around and asking for explanations of ideas and concepts and so on, 
uh, because they're able to do that, they're thinking, oh my gosh, this patent guy is so wonderful. Most of our tests are online, untimed. They can, uh, you know, I can uh, do open book. I can ask other people to help me and so on. And they're thinking, you know, how easy is that? And then once they get going, they realize they're spending a lot of time looking things up, learning things, relearning things, taking the next attempt and so on. So it eats up much more of their time because they're actually forced to spend time on the course outside of class. Um, but they don't feel the pressure because, hey, I'm getting away with something. I have an open book online on time test that I'm taking. And isn't this wonderful? So it's kind of a win-win in that regard. So I want to address some of the specific uh, issues that come up. And uh, I'll tell you that, like most things, I, I let this roll around in my brain for a long time and asked lots of questions, did lots of reading, and um, kind of brainstormed with myself and with some of my colleagues and, you know, kept pointing out like, well, you know, if it's open book and they really can ask each other, aren't they all just going to, uh, you know, uh, create some big, huge uh you know, copy of the test bank and look up the answers that way. And I finally concluded, you know, let them. I mean, if that's what they're going to do, they're still going to be practicing. They're still going to be handling this information in some way. And uh, I mentioned on my previous podcast that the way I set these up is in um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, what some day different systems, learning management systems have different names for these things, but they're often called question sets, randomized question sets, random sets, uh, and so on. So the way it works is, uh, let's say item one on my test um, is about, oh, I don't know, uh, cell structure. Uh, well, let's say it's a, specifically about um, the fact that uh, a cell will typically have a, a nucleus uh, surrounding cytoplasm and uh, plasma membrane. So that's, you know, the, the concept I want to test. Well, for test one, I might actually in my test bank have 15 different ways of asking that. And so, um, and some might be visual, some are verbal and so on. Because, you know, with online tests, you can do that. You can put pictures in it and so on. You can even put sound clips in it. Not that I have a sound clip of a nucleus, but I don't know, maybe someday we'll be recording nuclear sounds and that'll be important to us. My point is, is that they can be a variety of different formats, styles, and content of those questions. So every time a student opens up a new attempt, they're likely to get a different one of those 15 different possibilities. Even if they get the same one that they had in a previous attempt, when they get to question two, the odds that they're going to get the same one they've had before for number two are really low in the third and the fourth and the fifth. Now, there might be a few items that only have like three possibilities. So those might show up more uh, frequently as repeats. And other randomized sets might have 25 items in it. And so those are like hardly ever going to show up uh, any one individual one. It's like winning the state lottery or something. And um, I did. I had sat down with a math professor uh, when I first started doing this to try and figure out, okay, given my typical test, the number of items I have, the average number of uh items in each randomized set. Um, and not only that, but the fact that you can, if it's a multiple choice question, you can randomize, or even a matching question, you can randomize the order in which the choices are given. And so we plug that all into uh, a computer. I remember sitting in the back of a, of a faculty meeting where we were supposed to be paying attention to something else, but we were trying to work out what are the odds. And the calculator that the math professor had couldn't handle the answer. It gave us an error because the the number was so high. Um, that is the the uh, uh, number of various iterations you could have that test was so huge that the calculator couldn't even handle it. So the the odds that any group of students can be that well organized and spend that much time trying to reconstruct my test bank, well, let them do it. Because it it's not really going to happen, and um, and I do want them when they uh, take their first attempt, I want them to study that. I want them to learn what went wrong, what went right, and review it, and then prepare for the second attempt. And then they'll take the second attempt. They'll probably get a couple wrong at least there, and then they can fix that. 
because they'll have been asked something in a different way or they'll be, have been asked a slightly different aspect of something. I mean, you know how tests are, right? I mean, we don't ask every single fact that they need to know in the course. It just there's no test long enough to be able to do that, and at least not in A and P. So um, uh, it's always just kind of a sampling anyway, but they're getting a different sampling every time. And so uh, by the time they get to the third one, they have really practiced this numerous times. They've really spent some time looking at where their weak areas are and trying to brush up on it. And then uh, by the time they get to the midterm or the final exam, uh, they uh, really have it embedded in their long-term memory uh, rather than just learning it for the night before. And that's the thing about uh, using space retrieval practice in general and uh, this method in particular, whether you're using uh, your own homegrown online testing uh, system or uh, that is built into the learning management system, or you're using one that's provided by the publisher, uh, either way, you're getting things into long-term memory, not things that are being crammed in the week before, the day before, the night before, the hour before the, uh, the test happens. Because we know that that just goes right back out of your brain. Well, no, it's still in your brain somewhere, but we're, we're very rarely able to retrieve it again because we haven't practiced retrieving it. So getting back to the nuts and bolts of the way I did it, I did it in a learning management system. Now, I used a tool called Respondus, which is a standalone set of software that your school might already have a, a license for, and they're not all that expensive to get. And it's basically a test editor. And uh, the the thing that's neat about it is that uh, when you construct your tests in Respondus, uh, so you put in the item, you put in choices, there are different formats that uh, can be chosen and so on, uh, you can change what Respondus calls the personality of your test. That is, you can change it from Canvas, which is the learning management system I use at one of my schools at my community college, uh, or I can switch it to um, D2L which is uh, uh, a learning management system I use at another one of my colleges that I teach at. Uh, and if one of them decides to change to, I don't know, to Blackboard or something like that, I can just switch the personality and it'll convert all those items. Now, you, if you've ever changed learning management systems, you know that sometimes things don't translate 100%. So what'll happen is when I change the personality on a test I've saved, then it'll get, generate a report and say, here's the 12 items that could not be converted. And it, because that format doesn't exist in the new learning management system or some other reason. So I know where to go in there to either fix the item or to delete that item, maybe replace it with something else. So the next question I get, is, okay, so the first question was, what about the open book part of it? Aren't you afraid that they're going to rely on their book and so no, because students don't want to look things up if they don't have to. And the more practice they do, the less looking up they have to do. So that's okay. Sort of related to that is cheating. And so, that, yeah, there are ways to cheat if you have somebody else take your test for you. And that's a problem with any kind of online learning, right? Um, and I have a whole set of strategies for that that I'll get into in another podcast. You can look through my blog. Some of it I've already published it uh, in my uh, A&P professor blog. But, uh, but uh, I'll just leave one here because it's very specific to online testing. And that is do what uh, the big security agencies do. Do you ever notice that when they're talking about security at an airport, they'll say that, well, there are other strategies that they won't reveal uh, at this time uh, for security reasons. Well, of course not. If you lay out there exactly everything you're doing to protect something, in this case, protect the integrity of the test, then um, people are going to find ways around all of those if they have the whole list. But if you say, you know, I, I use a variety of techniques to monitor this, and you'd be surprised at what I know about uh, how you're taking the test and what I can tell. And um, that can be a deterrent. And um, sort of linked with that is the idea that if you do catch someone cheating, then make sure that you announce that, not say, you know, Joe or Jill over here, uh, I caught them cheating and here's how I caught them and so on. Just say, 
this this behavior was happening. Uh, we have ways of finding out that it's happening. The student uh, is in the process of being disciplined, and you need to be careful that you don't um, have this lapse in integrity yourself. And uh, you'd be surprising how effective that is. Uh, and there are, and it's not a lie, there are things you can do that you don't necessarily want to reveal. There are timestamps. I caught a cheater one time who was in my class, and I remember her being in my class while her boyfriend was over in the library taking her test for her, which was a bad move in a variety of ways, probably the worst of which was that he did even worse than she did when she took her own test. So she was trying to up her up her course grade by having somebody else who wasn't even in the class and had never taken the class do her test. So uh, not a good move. But uh, but that's how I caught her, was looking at the timestamps. And I also got a tip from one of the librarians that said, hey, I think something funny is going on with this student. You might want to check it out. So I even I have spies, a network of spies out there that are watching this stuff. But it really is kind of hard to cheat on my test because it is open book and so on. You really would have to recruit somebody else to take your test to be a cheater on the online test. Now, the in-class test, that's a whole other ball of wax, isn't it? In you know, getting back to this idea of students helping one another, um, you know, a lot of my colleagues say, well, you know, aren't you afraid that they're going to help one another? No, I want them to collaborate. Collaborative learning is a great way to learn. When they're out there in their various clinical fields, aren't they going to be uh, consulting with each other? Do I want a nurse taking care of me who's afraid to ask another nurse how something is done? Or can they help them refresh this because it's been a while since they did this particular procedure or gave that particular kind of, uh, of medicine or treatment or whatever? And um, uh, no, I, I want them to develop those skills of doing it. I don't want uh, them to necessarily get the answers from somebody, but I want them to talk through the answers with other people. That would be great. It's a great learning experience. And uh, some colleagues ask, well, aren't you afraid that your students are going to print out their tests and pass them along to other students? Nope, I'm not afraid of that either. Uh, because then that just gives them more practice, more opportunities to look at the tests and see what kinds of things I'm going to be asking, how I'm going to be asking them, and so on. And uh, maybe they can help each other figure out what went wrong on the items that they got wrong. And this, this, this is all automatically graded. So that means that this is all going on behind the scenes without me taking a lot of time to do it, or any time to do it, really, except kind of monitoring what's going on. And they get lots and lots and lots of practice by doing this. Now, the big question that I've saved for the end is, doesn't this take a long time to build, build such a big test bank? And the answer is, it takes about a year. What I did was I just decided I'm going to jump in with both feet. And so in a and 1 in the fall, this was many years ago now, I just went in and I just stayed one test ahead of them. And uh, every evening when I was done with the rest of my work for the day, I would sit down and spend 20 minutes, a half hour, just typing up test items. And it's like anything. Once you just finally do it, you start to get a hang, the hang of it. You start to get a feel for what makes good questions and what doesn't. I mean, you probably already have some of that, right, from writing tests anyway. But this is really going to fine tune those test item writing skills, I'll tell you that. And you get fast at it and you figure out good ways of, you know, changing items around so they're not the same item, but still asking about the same content, playing around with different formats and so on. And pretty soon I was going faster and faster and faster. And so by the time I got to the end of AMP2, it wasn't such a chore anymore. And anyway, I was close to being done. And then every year after that, I would go in again and just, you know, pull out the questions that I knew. Uh, were not well worded. And how did I know that? Because I get statistics. That's another beauty of these learning management systems. They tell you what the hard questions are, and you can look at them and see, uh, is that a hard question just because it's it's a hard concept to wrestle with? Uh, if so, then maybe I'll leave it in there, or maybe I'll just change it a little bit. Or is it a hard question because it's so confusing and people are going to put the wrong answer because they misinterpreted what I was asking them. So I can pull those out or change them. And then, of course, there's always uh, the opportunity to add more to those random question sets. So 
a question set that had only five items in the first time around. Now I can, you know, increase, bump that up to 10, have 10 different versions of that question go through. And so, you know, I'm always tweaking them, always editing them and so on. But once you get through that first year, it's easy. And actually halfway through that first year, it's not as bad as it sounds. But yeah, it does take time. And you can stretch it out longer if you want. But the big trick is just doing the first one. <laughs> it's like doing this podcast. My, it took me forever to start doing it. And now that I'm doing it, it's not so bad. It's actually kind of fun. I hope you're having fun too. The a and Professor is hosted by Kevin Patton, professor, blogger, and textbook author in human anatomy and physiology. Please do not use any of the suggestions you heard in this podcast if you are allergic to them. 